Hello, math students. The real roots of a polynomial. By way of review, we're going to perform the indicated division. Let's first focus on this long division of two numbers. Now, you might remember a process that looks something like this. We take that denominator number, which is 5. We put it off on the side. We do a long division notation, and then we put the numerator, the 123, underneath. One meaning of division, when you say 123 divided by 5, you can think of that as 123 broken up into five groups, and how much would be in each group if they're equal size, or you can think of it as how many fives make 123. We're gonna think that way. Well, it takes 20 fives to make 100, so I'm gonna begin with that, and we're gonna say 20 fives will make 100. So the next thing we do is we do the 20 times the five, we put 100 here, and then we subtract that from the 123 and see what's left over. We're still 23 unaccounted for. Well, how many times does five go into 23 without exceeding it? You would say uh, four more fives will do it. So we put a four there, and then we multiply the four and the five and get 20, and put that 20 here, and then remove. We stop when we get to a point where the number here is smaller than this number. And we put these two numbers together. We first removed 20 fives, and then we removed four more. So we really removed a total of 24 fives. So you might remember doing this kind of conclusion that 123 fifths can be rewritten as we do that 24, and then we had a remainder of 3, and we put that remainder over the original denominator. In other words, this is one way to convert to a mixed number. 123 fifths is 24 and 3 fifths. Or you can look at the result of this long division in the following way. If you are to multiply both sides of this by 5, and make sure you distribute the 5 to all parts, 123 fifths times 5 is 123 equals. Now I'm going to write a 24 parentheses 5, and then plus and then 3 fifths times 5 is just 3. This is actually the desired form moving forward. What it's showing us is that we answered the question, how many fives does it take to make 123? And we discovered that 24 fives gets us close. 24 fives gives us 120, and we've got to add these extra 3, and then we have the 123. Now all of these different components of this structure have names. We're going to call the 123, you can call it the numerator, but another name is called the dividend. The 5, you can call it the denominator, or another word is called the divisor. So in this context, we had the dividend is here, the 5 was the divisor, and now we need names for the other two components. Well, the 24, we're going to call the quotient, and the 3, we're going to refer to as the remainder. All right, so this process that you're likely already familiar with is exactly the process we follow when we do long division of polynomials. Now, the polynomial that we're going to divide, it's a third degree, and it's being divided by a first degree. You would only bother doing long division of polynomials if the numerator degree is at least as large as the denominator degree. We take the divisor, which is x minus 3, and write it here, long division notation, the dividend, which is 2x cubed, sometimes people will say you should put a zero placeholder for any missing powers of x. Notice there's no x squared term in our dividend. So this is sometimes done to give a, a place to think about the x squared terms. And then the x terms are minus 4x, and then the constant is 5. Now we ask ourselves, what do I have to multiply the leading term of the divisor by so that it's equal to the leading term of the dividend? Essentially asking this question. And of course, this can be answered by doing division, divide this over here, right, which simplifies to 2x squared. So that's what I'm looking for. If you put a 2x squared right above this 2x cubed, and then you multiply 2x squared times x minus 3. Same thing I did with this 20 times this 5, and I put the 100 right there. And we also have to distribute, so make sure that it distributes to both those numbers. And we get 2x squared times x, that gives me 2x cubed. And then 2x squared times negative 3 gives me negative 6x squared. You can see why it's desirable to have an x squared position. And you want to vertically align these, put the x cubes over each other and the x squares over each other. The very next thing, after I got this 100 over here, I then removed it. So we're going to do that exact same thing. This subtraction we need to distribute. Looking at the 2x cubed minus 2x cubed, that cancels. But then we have to do the minus and minus. Make sure that becomes plus. So we do 0x squared plus 6x squared, and that gives me 6x squared. And then these two terms right there are not affected by this subtraction, so you can just rewrite them. Then you repeat. You ask yourself, what do you have to multiply this leading term by so it's equal to that leading term? In other words, if you just do 6x squared divided by x, you get 6x, and you want to put a 6x. And we're going to wind up adding this 6x to the 2x squared, just like we added this 4 to that 20. Once I determined that I need a 6x there, 
we do the distribution. So take the 6x and distribute it to both those terms. And that gives me 6x squared to lead minus 18x. Then we need to remove this. So put this in parentheses, put a subtraction out there, and then I usually just mentally distribute. So the first part is 6x squared minus 6x squared. That becomes 0, so that's gone. This is going to be plus 18x. So negative 4x plus 18x is going to be positive 14x, and then plus 5. And I don't need to put this plus there. And we keep going. In fact, we continue until we get a remainder that's a degree less than the degree of the divisor. Well, the degree of the divisor is 1, and the degree of the remainder currently is 1, so we keep going. And we ask ourselves, what do I have to multiply this leading term by so that it's equal to this leading term? And the answer to that is 14. So put a 14 here, and we're going to wind up adding it to the other parts. Then we distribute the 14 to the x minus 3, and we get 14x minus, and 14 times 3 is 42. Then we're going to subtract this from the line directly above it. Well, the 14x's will cancel. We'll get 5 minus negative 42, so 5 plus 42, and we get 47. So this is considered a zero degree remainder, because there's no x anymore, and this is a first degree divisor. So we stop once we get a remainder that's a smaller degree than the divisors. Now we want to push these pieces all together, and I'm going to go straight to this form here in the box. So the dividend is 2x cubed minus 4x plus 5. I'll put it in parentheses just so we can think of it as a, a single thing. It's equal to the quotient. The quotient is the components we got up here. Just like over here, the quotient was 24, and that came from adding those components together. The quotient is adding those three terms. I'll put that in parentheses. 2x squared plus 6x plus 14 times the divisor. The divisor was x minus 3, and then plus the remainder, and the remainder is 47. You can view this as sort of a decomposition of a polynomial. Just like over here, we have a decomposition of a number. We had 123, and we decomposed it into 24 fives, got us close, and then we needed the extra 3 here to get to 123. Same thing's going to happen with these polynomials. If you multiply the quotient and divisor, you will get something, and then when you add the 47 to it next, you will wind up getting the original dividend. Okay, now this process can be greatly sped up by something called synthetic division. If your divisor is a second degree, like x squared minus 3, then you're going to want to use long division. But if your divisor is the form x plus or minus some number, then you can do what's called synthetic division. And then here's how it looks. You take the value of x that would make the divisor equal to 0, which in this case is 3. We can call this the root of the divisor. Put it up in the top left. I like to box it off. And then right next to it, I'm going to write down all the coefficients of the dividend. And here I must remember to put zero placeholders and make sure you go in order of decreasing power. The leading coefficient is 2. We start with that. Notice there's no x squared term, so I'll put a 0 next. The x coefficient is negative 4, and then the constant is 5, and that's where we stop. Give yourself a, a blank space right here, and then put a line underneath that. Okay, so the process is we bring this 2 down there, copy it down there. Then we multiply these two numbers, 3 and 2, and we get 6, and we put that product under the next coefficient. Then I add these numbers and get 6, and then I just keep repeating. Now I do 3 times 6, I multiply those, and I get 18, and I put that 18 right here. Then I add these ones, negative 4 plus 18 is 14. Then I multiply 3 and 14, and I get 42, and I put that right here. And then finally I add 5 and 42, and I get 47. Now these numbers should look familiar. The very last number I like to box off, because this is going to be your remainder. And the other three numbers are also significant. So these wind up being the coefficients of the quotient. If your dividend is third degree and your divisor is first degree, and if you subtract those degrees, that'll tell you what this first term here should be, so degree 2. And so in other words, our quotient will be 2x squared plus 6x plus 14. So we're not going to do much long division in this unit. Every time we have a divisor that is x plus or minus a number, I'm going to, going to just use synthetic division and do this, and then from there I can go straight to this answer. When a polynomial p of x is divided by x minus a, then the result can be expressed as follows. So here's summarizing what we just came up with. The polynomial is decomposed into a quotient times the divisor plus some remainder constant. So given this general structure, if you were to plug in the root of the divisor, the root of the divisor is the value of x that makes this part 0, which is going to be a, right? So if you plug a into this polynomial, you're going to get q of a, whatever that is, but then times 0, because a minus a will be 0, and then plus the remainder. Well, this will just 0 out right here, 
and you're going to get just the remainder. This tells us that whatever you get for the remainder can be interpreted as a y coordinate, as an output, because when you plug a into the polynomial and you get r back, then you know that a comma r is a point on the graph of the polynomial of p of x. Something else is going to be interesting. When r is 0, if a is a real number and r is 0, then we found a point on the graph that's on the x-axis. Okay, so the following statements are going to be true. If the remainder is 0, when you divide a polynomial by x minus a, that tells us that a is a root of that polynomial, which tells us that x minus a is a factor of that polynomial. Furthermore, if a is real, then it's also an x-intercept. If a is not real, it won't be an x-intercept. We'll talk about that in more detail in the next section of this unit. We're going to be doing synthetic division, and if I get a remainder of 0, I can conclude that x minus a, whatever a was that I used in my synthetic division, that x minus a will be a factor of the polynomial, and of course the other factor will be the quotient. Take a look at this structure right here. If r is 0, if this part isn't there, then all you've done to p of x is you factored it. One factor is x minus a, and the other factor is right there. It's the quotient. But of course, that's only true when r is 0. Otherwise, we can't say we factored it. We could say we decomposed it, but we can't say we factored it. In the same sense that if you write uh, 7 is equal to 2 times 3 plus 1, which is a true statement, this is a decomposition of 7. It's not a factoring of 7. Okay, so determine whether the given binomial is a factor of the corresponding polynomial. If so, express the polynomial in factored form. The first example, our binomial is x minus 2, and our corresponding polynomial is right here. It's a third degree. We want to determine if x minus 2 is, in fact, a factor of 4x cubed minus 5x squared minus 9. And the way to do that is to do synthetic division. We take the root of the divisor. In other words, what value of x, when you plug it in here, will make 0? And the answer to that is 2. And then put the coefficients of the dividend, and the dividend is this polynomial here. Don't forget your zero placeholders. So we start with 4, that's a leading coefficient. Negative 5 would be next, but that's the x squared. And there is no x term, so make sure the zero goes there. And then the constant is minus 9. And then we're going to do synthetic division. We bring the 4 down. We multiply the 2 and the 4 next and get 8. Right? Then we add the 8 and negative 5 and get 3. Then we multiply the 3 and the 2 and get 6. When we add those, we get 6. Multiply 2 and 6, we get 12, and add that to negative 9, and we get 3. And this last number here is our remainder. I should also mention the power of these symbols right here. These are if and only if statements. It's a forward implication and a reverse implication. It's more powerful than just one direction. Kind of like saying, if it is raining outside, then it is wet outside. That would look something like this. Rain implies wet. But is it true that wet implies rain? The answer is no. It might be wet outside because of sprinklers. Not every implication can be reversed and be true still. But when you can go forwards and backwards, like, like we were saying here, then one way of saying that these two statements, they always go hand in hand. When one is true, the other is true. When one is false, the other is false. And same is true connecting these two. If one of these statements is true, so is the other. If one is false, and so is the other. Hence, you can do first and third. If one is true, then the other is true. If one is false, the other is false. So it's a very powerful combination of statements here. But anyway, we just got a remainder that's not zero. So this is false, which means a is not a root, which means x minus a is not a factor. All right, so if this one's false, then that's false, and that's false. And so we get to say that x minus 2 is not a factor of 4x cubed minus 5x squared minus 9. Okay, let's move to the next one. So this time our divisor is x plus 1. So the, the general form of dividing has to be x minus a. So if I'm saying x plus 1, that just means your a is negative 1. So it's negative 1 that I want to use in my synthetic division. Leading coefficient's negative 5. The x cubed has a coefficient of 6. There's no x squared, so 0 goes into the x squared position, negative 3 in the x position, and 8 in the constant. And bring down the minus 5. Multiply with negative 1 makes 5. Add those together is 11. Multiply negative 1 and 11 makes negative 11. Add to 0, we get negative 11. Negative 1 times negative 11 is positive 11. Add to negative 3, we get 8. And then negative 1 times 8 is negative 8. Add to that 8, we get a remainder of 0. Once we get a remainder of 0, this part just became true, which means that this is true. In other words, negative 1 is a root of this polynomial, and but also x minus negative 1. In other words, x plus 1 is a factor of this polynomial. And the other factor is the quotient. And the quotient is going to come from these numbers right here. Let's just call this p of x this polynomial p of x can factor. One factor is the divisor, and it doesn't matter which order you write the factors in. So the x plus 1 is one of the factors. The other factor comes from the quotient, which is from those numbers there. 
So we had a fourth degree divided by a first degree, so our quotient will be a third degree. It's going to be negative 5x cubed plus 11x squared and then minus 11x and then plus 8. Now I leave it to you to verify that when you multiply this out, you will get the original p of x right here. Now we are going to factor polynomials by using synthetic division and looking for remainders that are zero. Okay, first, before I go too much further, we need to talk about what rational means and what integer means. The natural numbers are 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. The whole numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. The integers, which is a 2 bar z like that, and the integers are 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., but also all the negatives. So 1 half is not an integer. Negative 100.1 is not an integer. A rational number, though, and a rational number is when you divide any two integers. So if you do 4, which is an integer, and divide it by negative 2, which is an integer, and you get negative 2, this is technically called a rational number because we got it by dividing two integers. Notice it's also an integer again. In other words, since every integer, if you start with any integer like 3, you can write this as a fraction of integers, or the easiest one is to put 3 over 1. So all integers are rational numbers, but not all rational numbers are integers. For example, if I do negative 3 over 2, in decimal form, it's negative 1.5. This is not an integer, but it is a rational number. So we're looking for all the roots that are rational numbers. Now, some roots are irrational numbers. Like we might see a root that's square root of 2. Square root of 2 is about 1.4, but it's, it cannot be written as a fraction of integers. This is an irrational number. So all the rational roots of a polynomial with integer coefficients are of the form p over q, where p is an integer factor of the constant and q is an integer factor of the leading coefficient. Okay, so this is actually quite simple to construct all possible rational roots of a polynomial. You look at the polynomial, and the only things you need to look at are whatever the constant and whatever the leading coefficient is. And we make a list of all the p's over the q's. Now we're going to put plus or minus in front of the entire list because we're looking for integer factors of these numbers. In the numerator, I'm going to make a list of all possible integers that divide into 9 evenly. 1 and 9 should be in this list, but so should 3. These are all the factors of 9. And put a plus minus in front of all of them, and we get all the integer factors of 9. Divide by, and now put all the factors of the leading coefficient, and all the factors of 4 are 1, 2, and 4. And it should be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4. But since every number in this list could be plus or minus, I'm just going to put plus or minus in front of the entire list. The next thing we do is we do all possible ways to make a fraction out of these numbers where your numerator is one of these and your denominator is one of these. And I like to go systematic. I do 1 over 1, then 3 over 1, and then 9 over 1. Then I shift 1 over 2, 3 over 2, and then 9 over 2. And then I shift 1 over 4, 3 over 4, and then 9 over 4. And this gives me all possible fractions I can make. In this list, it looks like it has 9 numbers, but each one is plus minus. So there's really 18 numbers represented by this list. These are the only possible rational roots of this polynomial. Now, there could be irrational roots as well. There could be a square root of 2 as a root. And there could also be non-real roots, like i or 3i. But if your roots are rational numbers, they will be somewhere in this list. This is going to really help us narrow down our guess and check. Because so we're going to go hunting through this list to look for remainders of 0. But before we do that, let's apply the rational root theorem to this polynomial. Again, all that matter are the leading coefficient and the constant. And we do our p's over our q's, plus or minus. And I'm going to make a list of all of the factors of 8. Well, that's going to be 1, 2, 4, and 8. Now I make a list of all the possible factors of 5. And I put that in the denominator. Well, 5 is prime, so it's just 1 and 5. And now I'm going to do everything over the 1 and then everything over the 5. And put plus or minus in front of this. So 1 over 1, 2 over 1, 4 over 1, and 8 over 1. 1 over 5. 2 over 5, 4 over 5, and 8 over 5. Sometimes when you're doing this, you're going to get repeated numbers. Like later down the list, you might get a 2 over 10, for example, if this were a different problem. But 2 over 10 would already be in our list. So if you want to keep your list as concise as possible, then don't bother writing the fractions that wind up being repeats of fractions you've already written. Again, this polynomial, if it has a rational root, it'll come from this list. And there are technically 16 numbers in this list. Find all the real roots of the polynomial below, express the polynomial in factored form, and graph it without using technology. So we're going to start with the rational root theorem. First of all, notice that all the coefficients are integers. So we can use the rational root theorem. I'm going to make my list down here, the p's over the q's. I list all the factors of 20 in the top. So 1, 2, 4, 5. And you should see symmetry happen 
Once you get to two numbers that are as close together as you can get and multiply to 20, then you're going to see a pattern occur. You're going to get the complement of 2 as far as 20 is concerned. In other words, 2 times what equals 20, and the answer that's 10. And then the last number is going to be the complement of 1. 1 times what equals 20, and the answer is 20. And then all this over the factors of the leading coefficient. Well, the leading coefficient is negative 1, so just 1 is all we get there. In other words, uh, our list of p's over q's, we don't even need that 1 at all, and we get just this list of numbers. And now get ready with your eraser, and we are going to go on a hunt for remainders of 0. And we're going to just start using numbers from this list, and we'll start with the easiest numbers. I recommend you do plus minus 1, then plus minus 2, and plus minus 4, and we're looking for roots. We're looking for remainders of 0. So let's start with a positive 1. I'm going to put a 1 in the corner. I'm going to write down the coefficients of this polynomial. Look for any missing powers of x. I have 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. All the powers of x are there, so I don't need any 0 placeholders. So the coefficients are negative 1, negative 4, 1, 20, and 20. I'm going to write a little bit smaller, so I'm going to give myself some space over here. You'll see why. I'm going to write down the polynomial itself. Negative x to the 4 minus 4x cubed plus x squared plus 20x plus 20. Okay, we are on a quest for a 0 remainder. Let's see if 1 does it. So we bring down the negative 1. Multiply 1 and negative 1, negative 1. Add negative 4, negative 1, we get negative 5. Multiply 1 and negative 5, we get negative 5. Add those together, we get negative 4. Multiply negative 4, add 16, multiply 16, and we get a 36 here. This tells us that 1 is not a root of this polynomial. Therefore, x minus 1 is not a factor. And we abandon it in our list, and we move on to the next guess. Now, this information isn't useless, though. It does tell us that when you plug 1 into the polynomial, you're going to get 36 as the y-coordinate. So we do find a point by doing this. But we're looking for the roots so that we can factor the polynomial. So here comes the eraser. Erase everything, including that 1, and we move on in our list. What you can do is take this list and actually write it twice. Once the positives, and then once is going to be all the negatives. So we have 12 numbers in this list. And as soon as you find one that doesn't give you a remainder of 0, you can cross it out. But now let's try the minus 1. Okay, minus 1 goes in right there. And this minus 1 drops, multiply, get a 1, add. I'm going to go a little bit faster here. I don't get a remainder of 0. I get to go down to my list down here and say, okay, negative 1 didn't work also. So let's go to 2. Let's try 2. Negative 1 drops. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. Add those is negative 6. Multiply negative 12. Add negative 11. Multiply negative 22. Add, we get negative 2. Multiply negative 4. Add, we get 16. That didn't seem to work either. So take your time, make sure you're doing this right. Let's try negative 2. Negative 1 drops. Negative 2 times negative 1 is 2. Add those is negative 2. Multiply is 4, becomes a 5. Multiply these is negative 10. Add those is 10. Multiply these is negative 20. We get a 0 remainder. Check. This means that we have effectively factored the polynomial. One factor is going to be x minus the number there. So in other words, x plus 2. The other factor is going to be the quotient coming from those four numbers. It's going to be a cubic. So it's going to be negative x cubed minus 2x squared plus 5x plus 10. Okay, now our goal should be, just like when you're doing a factor tree, right? If you have like 24 and I break that into 2 and 12, where 2 is prime and 12 is not prime, then you would keep that 2, but keep trying to factor the other parts. Prime, prime, not prime, so keep factoring, and you create this factor tree of numbers. We're going to do the exact same thing here, but with the polynomial. So now our focus shifts entirely onto this polynomial, and we want to factor that. So we only work with this. Now here's a nice thing, you don't have to redo a list of p's over q's. You can still keep working with the same list of p's over q's. If a number was x'd out in an earlier step, it will not work in a subsequent step. But once you find a number that works, you should try it again. And so we're going to set up synthetic division with these four numbers now. Line, we crop this off, and we're looking for a remainder of 0 again. That's our goal. And I recommend you try negative 2 again. Keep trying a number until it stops being a root, and then you move on down the list. So negative 1 drops. Negative 2 times negative 1 is 2. Add those is 0. Multiply is 0. Add is 5. Multiply is negative 10. Add it. So it did work a second time. We got a remainder of 0. What this means is that this first x plus 2, that's considered done. That's not what we're factoring any longer. But this quotient factors itself. One of them is x minus negative 2, so x plus 2. And the other factor comes from this quotient right here, which is going to be quadratic, or second degree. So negative x squared plus 5. Now once you get to a quadratic quotient, you really don't need to keep doing synthetic division because you can always find the roots of this in the worst case scenario is by doing the quadratic formula to find the last two roots. I'm going to do a step now where I'm going to factor this negative out. I don't like having a negative leading coefficient, but I'm going to factor out to the very front. And you can see that we have a difference of squares. Even though 5 is not a perfect square, we can still factor it. 
You can combine those into one and just put a square right there. And then factoring that, we get x minus radical 5 and times x plus radical 5. Remember, a squared minus b squared factors to a minus b times a plus b. And we consider this to be the factored version of our polynomial. Find all the real roots. So we have a total of three real roots. By real, I mean no i is present. And the roots are negative 2. And the multiplicity is 2. Negative radical 5 and positive radical 5. And these are each multiplicity 1. Keep in mind that the square root of 5 is approximately 2.24. So graphing this polynomial, going back to what we learned from the last unit, this is a negative x to the fourth, so I expect both ends to point down. We have a total of three x-intercepts. All the roots are real, so all of them will be x-intercepts. Negative 2 is an x-intercept. Negative 2.24, so not much further past that, and we'll just go there. And positive 2.24, so somewhere right there. These are your roots. You could find the y-intercept very easily. If you plug 0 into this, you're going to get that 20. We'll use a different scale for the vertical. We'll say that that's 0, 20. As long as you label, then it'll be clear. Okay, we know the graph has to point down, so we've got to get to this first intercept right there. And do we cross it or bounce off? Well, negative root 5 has a multiplicity of 1, so we cross at that location. Zoom in, you're going to expect the graph to cross, turn around, hit this one, but smoothly bounce off it, because negative 2 had a multiplicity of 2. Negative 2 has an even multiplicity, that means we don't cross the x-axis there. Uh, which is good, because we had to get to this point here, and then somewhere it's going to max out, and maybe it doesn't max out at 0, 20 but then it's going to have to turn around and get to this point at which it crosses again because of the odd multiplicity, which is good because I wanted the polynomial to finish going down anyway. So this is a basic rough sketch of what this polynomial will look like. I leave it to you to reach for the technology and confirm that this is your basic shape. Again, I don't exactly know where this highest point will be. That peak could be a variety of places. That's more of a calculus topic. Let's move on to the next slide here. The length of the base of a box is twice the width of the base. The height is one foot less than the width. The volume of the box is 18.75 cubic feet. Find the dimensions. Let's call this the width, this the length, and this the height. We are told that the height is one foot less than the width and that the length is twice the width. So I'm going to introduce the width as x because it seems like everything is based on the width because the length was twice that and the height was one foot less. So x minus one should be the height. Everything will be measured in feet here. And we know the volume is 18.75. Well, we also know the volume formula is width times length times height. That gives us 18.75 is equal to x times 2x times x minus 1. So we get 18.75. This will just be 2x squared, and I'm going to distribute. So 2x cubed minus 2x squared. And then I'm going to create a 0 on one side by doing a little bit of subtraction. Well, notice the polynomial set equal to 0. So in other words, it's like finding the roots of this polynomial. Now, first thing I would do is the rational root theorem. But in order to use the rational root theorem, the polynomial has to have integer coefficients. Well, 2 is an integer, negative 2 is an integer, but negative 18.75 is not. So what I want to do is find the smallest number that I could multiply this equation by that would make all of my coefficients integers, no more decimals, no more fractions. Well, 0.75 is 3 quarters. If I multiply by 4, this should do the trick. So we still get a 0 on that side, but the other side we get 8x cubed minus 8x squared minus, and then 18.75 times 4 will wind up being 75. And are there any common factors I could divide out of this? 2 and 4 are only numbers that go into 8, but they don't go into 75. So this is as reduced of a polynomial I can get while having only integer coefficients. Now I'm ready to do the p's over the q's. So we do all the factors of 75, put that in the top. Well, there's going to be a lot of numbers that divide into 75. 1 does, 3 does, 5 does. The next one would be 15, and I'm starting to see the symmetry. 5 times 15 is 75, so 3 times what? And then 1 times what? And 3 times 25 will be the next one, and the 1 times 75. Now we look to the leading coefficient. 1, 2, 4, and 8 are the only numbers that divide into that. Okay, so this actually gives us quite a long list. I'm just going to get it started. I would do everything over the 1. So that's going to give us 1, 3, 5, 15, 25, 75. Then I do everything over the 2 next, etc. This list is going to get quite long. I'm not going to write them all out. And just for time's sake, I will let you know that if you try all these numbers, none of them work, which means you have to venture into the fractions. And eventually, with enough time, you get to the point where 5 halves is going to be a number that gives us a remainder of 0. And let's just confirm that. So I'm going to write down the coefficients of my polynomial. 
Don't forget the zero placeholders. If you just write 8, negative 8, negative 75, you're going to be extremely frustrated, wasting a lot of time. You must write 8 is x cubed, negative 8 is the coefficient of x squared. There is no x, so 0. And let's confirm that 5 halves does it for us. Bring the 8 down, 5 halves times 8. Well, to multiply 5 halves times anything, do 1 half and then times 5. So let's do a half of 8, which is 4, times 5 is 20. 20 minus 8 is 12. Do half of 12, which is 6, times 5, which is 30. And then add 30 and 0. 5 halves times 30. Do half of 30, which is 15, times 5, which is 75. And sure enough, we get a remainder of 0. So we just found a root. Now that we know 5 halves is a root, we know x minus 5 halves is a factor. So we know x minus 5 halves is one factor. The other factor comes from those, so it's 8x squared plus 12x plus 30. And the other roots you might be looking for will come from factoring this. I leave it to you to try to factor that or use the quadratic formula and see if there are other answers to this. Remember, it's possible when you do a quadratic formula that you get imaginary roots. And if both the roots here are imaginary, then 5 halves is the only real root here. We'll talk more about imaginary roots in the next section, but as far as this problem is concerned, we found an answer. 5 halves is a root of this polynomial equation, which means 5 halves is a solution to this equation up here, which means it's what we're looking for for the width. So the width is 5 halves, and this was measured in feet. Remember, 5 halves is the same thing as 2.5. The length is twice that, so the length is 5 feet, and then the height is 1 foot less than the width, so it's going to be 1.5 or 3 halves. And I leave it to you to confirm that when you multiply these three numbers, you do in fact get the volume is going to be 18.75 cubic feet. Okay, that wraps up our discussion on finding the real roots of a polynomial.